You're listening to episode 79 of Pasta Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocio Carvajal, food anthropologist, Mexican culture and gastronomy educator. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. To find more information about my podcasts, lectures, food tour, publications and subscribe to my newsletter, check the links that accompany this episode's notes. we think about cookbooks from a very Western point of view is quite cynical. They have become an unavoidable element of the foodie culture and yet another item to cross out from the marketing checklist of a standard PR campaign for a chef, restaurant, bakery or brand. Glossy, sexy, colorful and incredibly tedious. Cookbooks are often little more than aesthetic objects that decorate our shelves and coffee tables. But from a historical and anthropological standpoint, cookbooks from past times are seen as rich social texts that provide information and context about specific food traditions or practices. And in food studies, they have been increasingly used as research tools and studied for the information they contain about a given place, time and the people who wrote them. When I was doing the research for this episode and I was pondering long and hard about what is left out of cookbooks, I had several conversations with the crew and my new colleague Drew Deckman as we were filming the fourth episode of Ingrediente, the show in Oaxaca. And we kept thinking that within the foodie world and food-related TV shows, the attention is often centered on how a recipe is made. But what we want to explore is why it is made. The truth is that most people myself included, seldom think about any of these things when, you know, distractedly browsing the modern or vintage cookery section of a bookshop. More importantly, we often miss out altogether the point that cookbooks are expressions of power. That historically, only those in a position of economic, racial, gender and social privilege are the ones that get to curate and dictate how to depict certain aspects of society, often from the perspective of the ruling classes. So they voice their aspirations, rules, prejudices, ideologies and forms of self-representation. In short, cookbooks, in many ways, have been tools of cultural propaganda, and a distracted read of them can result in the dangerous conclusion that based on them we are actually able to know what a whole society eats. Over the last decade, a new critical scholarship in Mexico has bridged critical cultural studies with history, creating a complex and much-needed approach to deconstruct and analyze culinary texts. So, celebrating the works of authors like Sarah Bach Geller, José Luis Juárez López, Ricardo Moreno Botello, Jeffrey Pilcher, Stefan Igor Ayora, and Raúl Mata, among many others. This episode begins with the exploration of how the first mass-printed cookbooks in Mexico were instrumental in shaping our own ideas of what in time would become the illusion of a national identity. How the people who compiled and published these books curated depictions of regional cuisines and built an idealized narrative of cultural mestizaje, or blend of cultures, through a series of culinary mythologies, careful selection of ingredients, recipes, and even a type of language that built the idea of a Mexican gastronomy. Now, it's a fair warning. This episode does get a bit feathery, 
and the discussion is somehow meandering. But if you bear with me, we will reach eventually to very interesting ideas. And of course, this episode comes with a very long reading list of free and paid resources that include books, academic papers and podcasts. And the link to get them all is on the notes of the show. Well, without any further delay, here it is, the last episode of season six. I hope you enjoy it. Over the last two seasons of the show, I have explored through many topics the complexity of the social, cultural, ritualistic, political and even spiritual aspects that food studies can help us explore about a specific place, time and culture that in our case is of course the Mexican multiverse. There are, however, many ways to explore the past and transformations of particular food practices. We can take, for instance, the route of gastro or agroarchaeology to study things like objects, soils and seeds. Or we can turn to forensic anthropology to find out what human remains tell us about a person's diet, health, life and the foodstuffs available. However, this way of obtaining information lacks key social and cultural context meaning we can only make partial assumptions about our findings. By contrast, if we want to study contemporaneous societies, we can use other research tools to explore through interviews, observation of specific culinary techniques, preferences, with the food traditions of a community, and also by accessing personal or family handwritten cookbooks. All of these types of information can help us build a richer and more nuanced social and cultural background. However, we must bear in mind that it will only serve the purpose of representing a very narrow group of people. So we have to be careful not to generalize our findings. And of course, we can go down the route of classic documental food history, which is the path that we will partially explore today, using primary sources commonly found in archives, like handwritten documents and indeed printed cookbooks, to inform our research. A quick technical reference to consider is that in Western history, 1436, is marked as the year when printed books first appeared after Johannes Gensflach zur Leiden zum Gutenberg, or Johannes Gutenberg for us, perfected the printed press. And just for context, the book The Honesta Voluptate e Valetudine by Bartolomeo Platina is considered Europe's first printed cookbook, published in 1474. And it wouldn't be until many centuries later that the first printed cookbooks made their appearance in Mexico, specifically in 1831. And I want to insist on the fact that working with historical cookbooks require us to have in mind that they do not represent a whole nation or even the whole of original cuisine. Because like I said at the top of the show, they are by definition the product of a deliberate intention to convey specific messages, and whatever information they present has been heavily curated. So, in order to have a critical way of working and engaging with these books, we must approach recipes, menus, and all the information they contain with very important questions, such as Why is it done this way? What is the origin of those techniques? What did the rest of society eat? Who were the intended readers? And what does it tell us about trade and agriculture? Are there religious elements present? Do the recipes reflect real or aspirational lifestyles? And which are the implicit cultural rules, taboos and preferences? What does the language and style of writing say about the author and the reader? And how does it refer to other cuisines or food traditions? 
And of course, this is just some of the many questions you can come up with. But I think you see the possibilities of an inquiry that historical cookbooks offer and what a rich source of information they can be if we know how to approach them and we come with the right key to unlock them. Over time, there have been different ways to attempt to describe and conceptualize Mexican food. And arguably the most common, albeit the most problematic, explanation is the idea that is the result of a continued evolution started by indigenous Mesoamerican cultures, and that after the Spanish conquest, it simply became, quote-unquote, enriched and gave way to a new fusion, bringing the best of both worlds. Well, I have to say that I coincide with many critical scholars in that this approach is quite misleading and reductionist, to say the least. And I will tell you why along this episode. So let's begin by saying that prior to the Spanish colonization of this land, there was no such thing as a uniform set of food traditions and practices across Mesoamerica. There were, however of course, many similarities. And it would be equally incorrect to assume that there was such thing as a defined Spanish cuisine, because saying that would invisibilize the existence of many regional traditions and, of course, the large influence of Muslim, Sephardi, Visigothic and Roman cuisines, as I explained on episode 78 of the podcast. And last, it is really important then to move away from the romanticized idea of how these food cultures came in contact with each other. In the case of the Americas, the way our indigenous cuisines came in contact with Spain's own was the result of violence, conquest, domination and resistance. I really like how Mexican-Spanish historian Pilar Gonzalvo Aizpuru explains this by saying that food history is not just about acquisitions and innovations, but also about losses, displacements and erasures, the result of the exercise of power. With this in mind, it is helpful to think of food as a cultural system that is organized through a series of practices that have been inherited, adapted, or imposed. It also has its own material culture, that is, utensils and spaces, methods and meanings, symbolisms and beliefs that create rules. In my own research, I call all of this a culinary grammar. Now, going back to the first printed cookbooks that appeared in Mexico, we find that in fact, there were two, and not just one, that made their debut the same year. That was uh, 1831. And the books in question are, first, El Cocinero Mexicano, o Colección de las Mejores Recetas para Guisar al Estilo Americano, published in three volumes by Mariano Galván Rivera. And the other one is Novísimo Arte de Cocina, published by Alejandro Valdés. The publication of these two was followed by the debut of El Cocinero y Cocinera Mexicanos, published by Antonio Díaz in 1851. And later on, Manual del Cocinero dedicado a las señoritas mexicanas from 1856, printed by Manuel Murguía. There were also three contemporaneous cookbooks published in the city of Puebla, that had an enormous impact in Mexico due to their widespread circulation. And these are La Cocinera de Todo el Mundo, compiled and published by Juan Nepomuceno del Valle in 1844, Manual del Cocinero y la Cocinera, published by José María Macías in 1849, and a very famous La Cocinera Poblana o El Libro de las Familias, compiled and printed by Narciso Basols in 1877, which is the first one that gives a wider representation to a big range of poblano dishes. If you want to know more about the historical importance of Puebla's gastronomy, 
I suggest you check episode 72 of the podcast. I will leave the link for you. Now, I really don't want to make a comparative analysis of these books, but what I'm going to do instead is explore how a critical read has helped us study the emergence of several aspects. First, how these books helped build the idea of a cocina mexicana and how the concept of a Mexican gastronomy emerged as part of a wider political and social reconfiguration during the transition from the colonial regime to the establishment of an independent republic and the cultural and ideological implications of it. In other words, what these cookbooks did was to offer a solution to the problem of giving a culinary identity to a new independent nation. So who were the people that compiled these books and which was the primary audience? Let's begin by saying that contrary to the belief that the War of Independence was a widespread social movement to liberate and benefit the whole of the Mexican society, this was in fact a war led by one particular social group, the Criollos, who were the children of settlers, that is, Spanish mamá and Spanish papá, but had been born in the Americas. That fact alone made them second-class citizens below Spanish people, and therefore unfit to rule. The consequences of this racial and cultural subordination were, among many other factors, that became the seeds of rebellion. So, what were they fighting for? Well, first, they wished to remove Spain-born elites from power, break all ties with the Spanish crown, and reclaim their right to rule over the rest of society while maintaining the very stifled social hierarchies. Now, this phenomenon was by no means exclusive of Mexico. Similarly, across Latin America, other countries went through a similar process in which criollo elites ascended to power and then went on to reshape a new cultural identity in which food gave representation to their values, ideas and aspirations. So what we find in general terms among the pages of these cookbooks is that the recipes and accompanying texts reflect the creativity and resourcefulness of the publishers who translated conflict into negotiation. Because these elites didn't identify themselves as Spaniards, nor did they define as indigenous because they were not. So instead, and probably without making a conscious decision, started creating something that historian Anthony Brading calls criollo patriotism through a series of nationalistic mythologies, in which the role of a romantic view of the past and of the land helped legitimize a culinary ideal that projected the greatness and quality of everything it produced. This was indeed a metaphor for themselves. Now, I get that this might sound a bit abstract, so let me put it in other terms. This is how I read it. From a sociological perspective, the criollo elites had identity issues. They had an inferiority complex because for centuries they were made feel inadequate by the so-called peninsulares or Spain-born upper classes. And while they were incredibly privileged in every aspect of their lives, the land where they were born just as them would never be good enough. And because of that, they would never be able to break the proverbial glass ceiling. After they won the War of Independence, they sought to create narratives to champion themselves and projected all that with descriptions of the landscape and the produce itself, all the greatness and nobility they so craved to feel empowered. Cookbooks then became a way to express what those ideals tasted like, what nationalism looked and felt like. 
One of my favorite Mexican food historians, uh, Sarah Bach Geller, has written extensively about the influence of French culinary canons as a template for Mexico's first printed cookbooks that not only influenced the writing style, the form of presenting the recipes and naming um, cooking techniques, they also included extensive descriptions of how to set a table, how to serve each curse, which was the correct way to use cookware, crockery and cutlery, and how to create a menu. But the interesting thing is that they very cleverly repurposed many of these French concepts and forms of social etiquette to tell a very different form of understanding food. This was less about Frenchifying our gastronomy and much more about using France's influence as a template to create something new. Let me give you an example from the book El Cocinero Mexicano, published by Mariano Galvan. In the second section of breakfasts, we find many recipes that use tortillas and other quintessential ingredients from Mesoamerica. In the introduction of this section, it reads, so this is my translation. These recipes are truly national, and they even seem to call for pulque to accompany them. For the delicate European taste, chiles are unbearable, and they, Europeans, go as far as calling them poisonous. But they do eat with great enthusiasm many other dishes loaded with garlic, mustard, and above all, pungent pepper that is no less strong than our chiles. It is only just because Spaniards have lived long enough among us, they have grown accustomed to chiles, and many eat them on a regular basis. They have also learned to drink pulque, which seems to be the only thing that restores their health when they grow old and have upset stomachs. However, ill-informed doctors, after having flicked through the pages of French medical books, have declared a war against stimulants, Chile's chief among them, going as far as saying that all chili plants should be destroyed. God forbid we put ourselves on the hands of these doctors. Amen. <laughs> Literally, the amen is included. <laughs> and you see how I am not really joking around when I say how ideologically loaded these books are. How the author establishes a distinction between them and us, between Criollos and Spaniards, to illustrate who is Mexican and who is not. And he glorifies chiles and pulque while thrashing Eurocentric scientific attitudes against them. Now, what the Criollo elites did was indeed appropriating the cultural and natural world that existed on this land. These printed books, as historian José Luis Juárez López says, were a deliberate effort to imagine and give shape, you know, somehow coherent Mexican society to homogenize, at least around the table, the behaviors and manners, and of course, offered a curated list of dishes that were already part of such middle and upper urban classes, and in many cases, also included the taste of the rural gentry. But they were by no means an effort to give full representation to the cuisines of everyone. The decision was to honor a handful of key ingredients, fetishize their origin and glorify their past, but there was no intention to mention or champion the people who were the workforce of Mexico's food systems, rural communities, indigenous farmers, and their particular food practices. Equally important is the fact that the publishers of these early printed cookbooks I have mentioned are all men, And technically, these works are compilations, meaning that neither Mariano Galvan Rivera, Alejandro Valdés, Antonio Díaz, Manuel Murguía, Juan Epomuceno del Valle, José María Macías, nor Narciso Basols were the intellectual authors of any of the recipes. And then we can only speculate about how the editors obtained the recipes because there are no credits or recognition given to the people who facilitated that information. So we can only guess that they might have reached out to family members, 
friends and acquaintances to get handwritten recipes and scrapbooks. And that can very well be the reason why those dishes are only representative of a certain class and ethnicity. But regardless of all these, they were used to construct the idea of Mexican food and build a Mexican gastronomy. It wouldn't be until the 20th century when scholars and activists started contesting this, pointing out that it completely erased and silenced the food practices of indigenous and rural communities alike. But not only that, also urban working classes never had representation on the pages of these works. Ironically, British, French and Italian dishes did become part of Mexico's culinary repertoire as they were perceived as sophisticated and desirable. Unlike the ingredients and cuisines of Afro-descendants and descendants of Chinese immigrants, among other many ethnic minorities, who were never even considered worthy of any mention, yet they were, and are, by all accounts, part of the Mexican society. In many ways, we can say that to this day, we are currently going through a process in which we are questioning the very idea of Mexicanness by exploring how it originated and wondering if the concepts and values that gave it structure are relevant to us today. Many of us are wondering if we actually need to have one single definition of Mexican food and what purpose will it serve. Now, back to culinary nationalism. By the 1900s, a decisive Francophilia manifested itself in many ways during the 35-year period known as the Porfiriato. During this time, city centers got an extreme makeover, emulating the neoclassic fashion of the time. Waltzes and operas inundated the air. Patisseries, bakeries, restaurants, tibolis and cafes offered European-inspired menus. So what we see here is that coinciding with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution in Mexico, the vision of a modern state led by then-President Porfirio Díaz and his cabinet, had created a new set of aspirations for the middle and upper classes. Their forms of entertainment, socializing and even partying were all mimicking an impossible European dream. And in doing so, they created new forms of exclusion, social tensions and deepened the resentment of the many social groups that were not part Of this mirage. To give you a good example of these, let me tell you the menu that was part of the banquet served for 10,000 guests, organized by Chef Sylvain Dumont and the First Lady Carmelita Romero Rubio to commemorate the centenary of the War of Independence on September 15, 1910. Rather than being a celebration of all things Mexican, In a very paradoxical way, it was indeed a love letter to France. The menu had 12 curses and included the following. Consommé riche, petit pâté à la rousse, escalope de dorade à la parisienne, noisette de chérouille et purée de champignons, foie gras de Strasbourg en croûte, filet de drante avec chauffe-froid sauce, popier de veau à l'ambassadrice, salade charbonnière, Brioche mousseline avec suc de rosei et d'abricot, glace dame blanche, desserts, coffee and tea. And all of this was, of course, accompanied by rivers of French wine and distilled spirits. Early printed cookbooks started a very consequential process That was the systematization and creation of culinary categories that continued for several decades after other similar publications followed this path and continued homogenizing and classifying traditions. There is one case that is representative of the complex and problematic consequences of these 
And that is what happened with a group of dishes known now as moles. Across the many indigenous cultures of Mesoamerica, there were many shared ingredients and culinary techniques that inspired similar but not identical solutions that resulted in distinctive dishes like washmole, chilmole, clemole, ayomole, wachimole, mishmole, teshmole, and many more. You may have noticed that most of them share the suffix mole, which in Nahuatl language can mean either ground or to grind, meaning that it's very likely that the linguistic influence of the Mexica Empire either modified or took over the original names of some of these dishes. But what it doesn't imply is that they necessarily shared the same cooking methods, flavor profiles, colors, textures, density, or ingredients, even though they all were and still are prepared and consumed as main dishes. But again, the perceived need to organize, classify, and offer a compendium of the existing culinary repertoire in cookbooks triggered the idea to unify them all under the umbrella concept of mole. During my recent visit to the state of Oaxaca, while, as I mentioned, uh, filming the docu-series uh, Ingrediente de Show, I had the honor of meeting traditional cooks, including Olga Cabrera, owner of the restaurant Tierra del Sol, that specializes on dishes from Olga's region, which is the Oaxacan Mixteca. The dishes she prepared included three generations mole, which is a family recipe, huachimole, mole blanco, a white mole made with fresh chile de agua and served with fleshy oyster mushrooms, chile ajo amarillo, mole de laurel, and of course her famous pink mole, a recipe of her own creation dyed with an infusion of cochineal. While she was cooking and in between takes, I discussed with her the notion that the official culinary canon set by the tourism board and institutional discourses have only centered the attention on the so-called seven moles from the valley of Oaxaca, meaning that gastronomically speaking, the formal branding and marketing of the state has been largely based on the food traditions of the valistocracy, meaning that it's mostly the upper classes of the capital who have real representation at the proverbial table. And that precisely is what she and other outsider cooks from different regions of Oaxaca are challenging, questioning that canon, disrupting and upsetting the status quo while gradually taking over the food scene with never-before-seen dishes in the city of Oaxaca. One of the most profound moments of our conversation was when she talked about huachimole, a dish from her hometown that is prepared with huaje seeds, that in her own words should be considered Oaxaca's original and most culturally significant mole, as the very name of the state of Oaxaca and its capital comes from the word huaxiacan, which means land of huaje trees. And unlike mole negro, that is heavily influenced by ingredients and techniques of the novel Hispanic period, only gives partial representation of the culinary diversity of Oaxaca. You see, what I want to establish here is that culinary nationalism is a concept that is anything but neutral, as it has been historically shaped, politically framed, and ideologically designed, and printed cookbooks have played a fundamental role at establishing that from very early on and creating a genealogy of gastropolitics in Mexico. Taking a few leaps forward in time, and we reach the contemporary period that saw the institutionalization of culture led and set in motion by UNESCO, which, among other things, encouraged the listing of cuisines and food tradition in order to obtain the formal status of intangible heritage of mankind. In the previous season of the show, on episode 66, I made a critical retrospective of the last 10 years since the Michoacán paradigm was listed as intangible cultural heritage and what it meant 
for Mexican gastronomy. So I will leave the link uh, for you to check that out. But what I'm interested on today is uh, trying to deconstruct for you the implications of politicizing and commodifying food practices. And what I want to make you aware of is the fact that consolidating an idea of a national cuisine came at the cost of appropriating traditions, creating stories and myths, and wrapping it all up with a glossy, shiny coat of authenticity. According to the critical opinions of authors like Raoul Mata and Charles Edouard de Souremain, the process of listing a food practice implies the appropriation of traditions of a specific group or community by an elite for specific interests. May these be economic exploitation, cultural prestige, political gain, diplomacy and soft power, and so on. The fact is that under the misleading umbrella concepts of preservation, safekeeping, or stewardship, the idea of appropriating and exploiting traditions in order to quote-unquote rescue and maintain has led to all sorts of abuses in which ingredients, aesthetics, and dishes are exoticized to allegedly celebrate our cuisines, while conveniently never talking about how exactly that is benefiting the actual owners of those traditions, that is, the cooks, the farmers, the fishermen. They seldom feature in any of this. Because, in essence, this is just a big performance of the curated idea of Mexicanness at the service of the hospitality industry. But grim and morally bankrupt as all this might seem, thankfully, this is not the whole picture of what is happening now. And I have recently had the opportunity to see, experience and get to know a very different way of understanding and generating value and economic growth through projects owned by those who own the traditions, for whom these things are not practices of the past, but part of their way of life. A way of life that, as a matter of fact, has been for centuries been attacked, oppressed, dismantled and denied. Until they started playing with a new set of rules, changing the terms of engagement and turning the heritage paradigm on its head. The specific example I want to share with you is a group of indigenous entrepreneurs from a town called San Mateo Osolco, located in the slopes of the Popocatépetl volcano in the state of Puebla, which is one of several villages that have unique endemic kinds of corn, including an emblematic blue variety known as maíz azul osolqueño. The origin of this story, in a nutshell, is that Leobardo Telles, Alberto Rincón and Lino Hernández Ríos are part of a large diaspora of poblanos osolqueños that emigrated illegally to the U.S. And thanks to community networks, found jobs in Philadelphia, working, among other places, in the restaurant industry. Like thousands of illegal immigrants who risk everything in search for a better life for them and for their families, they were part of the phenomena called circular migration, until they decided to capitalize their experiences, skills and talents and return to Osolco permanently. After undergoing a radical change of perspective, they gradually came up with new ways to engage with pride, with their culture, framing traditions and way of life of their community in a different way and went on to create a series of co-ops all based on the celebration, preservation and reintroduction of endemic varieties of corn. And so were born Masolco Azul, that makes blue corn tortilla chips, Coyotitla, an ice cream parlor specialized in corn ice creams, and Mili, a restaurant based in Cholula that celebrates the produce and dishes from Osolco. But is their latest project called Bosque de Maíces, or Corn Forest, which is 
a whole day experienced, planned and delivered by them and their families, offering an introduction to what the way of life is in Osolco and their vision for their own future. And there are a series of very complex aspects that they have poured into this experience, which are the importance of farming, explaining how their cosmovision defines their relationship with the earth and the universe, natural heritage interpretation, which includes seasonal activities like agave sap extraction and the preparation of ayona cattle as part of the Tlazocamatli Chilacayotli ritualistic fermentation of a squash. All of these activities that involve a series of rituals they have created end in a communal feast, enjoying traditional dishes and new creations made with local ingredients. The most radical factors of this approach are that they have done all of these projects in their own terms, not dictated, financed or designed by any public policy. Second, they control all aspects of the projects, from owning the communal lands, spaces of work, assets and earnings. And last, they are also in total control of the distribution channels, forms of marketing and ways of networking and forms of delivery of the service, products and experiences they create. For them, cultural heritage is not a relic from the past. I really want to insist on this. Traditions, for them, are not static objects, but living, breathing ways of life and forms of being on this earth. And unlike mock rituals you might see in high-end resorts, where the performance of authenticity is yet another way of appropriation, by the so-called white sicans to Illuminatis and hippies with privileges. What these new forms of indigenous entrepreneurship are doing is a powerful cultural shift for them and for us. And it is also a lesson and a reminder that traditions constantly need to adapt and evolve to remain relevant. And the key thing of this is that they are also generating horizontal forms of cooperation and development by working with other micro-communities and thus building new forms of representation, agency and social economy. What Osolkenyu people are doing is not even described or presented as authentic, Mexican, not even regional or poblano but it's presented under a completely different perspective, without seeking the approval, ascription or acceptance into any official category. Well, this uh, series of reflections that I have presented have served, hopefully, the purpose of attempting to explain that the original intention and perceived need to galvanize the cultural and culinary identity of a new nation through a movement that started 200 years ago by an elite driven by the urge to impose their particular idea of mestizaje or cultural hybridization, their values and way of life in which they wanted to establish a way of representing their identity. All of this has had the effect, really, of perpetuating coloniality to this very day. And arguably, what we recognize today as Mexican and the way Mexicanness is expressed will always be but a partial, idealized glimpse of a much more complex, multidimensional universe allocated in a place we call Mexico. Right. <laughs> I will try to gather my thoughts um, through a series of loose, not quite conclusive ideas of what I presented on this episode. Again, over the last 200 years, cookbooks have shaped the way we think and perform Mexican-ness in the social arena, in the kitchen and on the plate. Generation after generation, a handful of editors, authors, cooks and gastronomes 
have built a set of skills, food knowledge, methods, techniques, a particular way of constructing and defining flavors, preferences and aesthetics that have been imposed as a canon over every other culinary expression in Mexico. What I try to provide you with here today is the notion that you can and you should always question official discourses about food traditions. I've tried to tempt you into looking for the motivations and intentions behind the idea of national cuisines and how we can use documental material like cookbooks as a way to explore how food has enabled people not only to imagine or reimagine who they are, but who they want to be and see through the paradoxes, conflicts, power struggles, aspirations and nostalgia what has shaped our identities as individuals, groups, societies and cultures. And last, we can say that Mexican cuisine doesn't really exist. It is an invention that we have only begun to deconstruct. Thank you for listening. This episode was researched, produced and presented by me, Rocío Carvajal. And as I promised, I prepared a long reading list to go with this episode, as well as a few suggested audible companions. And I will begin with those. From this podcast, that is Paz de Chipotle, I encourage you to either listen or revisit episode 56 called Diana Kennedy, Documenting the Memory of Taste. Also episode 66, 10 years of listed gastronomic heritage. And also from my other podcast, Hungry Books, I totally recommend episode 4, in which I review and critique a fantastic book called Delizia, the epic story of the Italians and their food by John Dickey that offers many great tools and perspectives to approach mm, the cultural construction of national cuisines. And as for the reading materials, well, they include books, articles and chapters. Some of them are free resources. Others are behind membership and paywalls. But I have them all. And if you need any of them, I will be more than happy to share any or all with you. Just get in contact with me. Remember, you can reach out on social media, find me and the show on Twitter as Chipotle Podcast and at Rocio underscore Carvajal C. On Instagram, you can find me as Rocio.Carvajal C. But you don't need memorizing any of that. You just go to the notes of this episode where you will see all the links. And of course, you can drop me a line to hello at Pazichipotle.com. Okay, friends. <laughs> Thank you all. We made it this far. And thank you for standing by uh, in these uh, long intervals. But remember that as ever, wherever I find on my path, I will always bring it here to you. Well, I think that's all for me today. Until the next time. <laughs>